On my way from Dungeness to Rye, I'm arranged to meet an old friend at New Romney, so I've decided to catch the 10.30 train. Well, it's right on time, so better hurry up. I'm told there's a special driver on duty today. When we get to New Romney Station, I'll find out who it is. It may look like every schoolboy's dream of an oversized train set, but this one, the Romney, Hyde and Dimchurch Railway, operates a commercial schedule, transporting 200,000 passengers a year, even taking children to school every day. The friend I'm going to meet is Vice President of the Railway Supporters Association. He travelled on one of the inaugural journeys when he was only four years old, and he's never grown out of it. I met him when I was doing an audition one day in 1946, and he became a fellow ghoul. He is, of course, Michael Benteen. <laughs> Michael Benteen, yes, I live sir. and breathe. Sir, oh, can I you see him as I live and nearly breathe? Oh, How are you, lad? Nice to see right. you. You're playing with my favourite toy. It's a beautiful train, isn't it? Isn't she gorgeous? Royal coach, you know. Royal coach, Queen Elizabeth II, Liverpool, for the uh, garden festival up there. And what's your connection with the railway, then? I went on the first train. My father knew Captain High very well. He and uh, Count Borowski were the two men that built the railway for the start. I came in as a little boy of four and helped the Gandhi dancers, as the track layers, yeah. to lay the track. Did you? And I heard my first Irish. It's been running now well over 60 years, and yeah. we've had Jubilee and everything. Yeah. And uh, it's one of the great things of the marsh because it brings great joy to an awful lot of people. You know this area for about 60 years, haven't you? Yeah. I was more or less brought up on it as a boy. Yeah, yeah. And I love it dearly because yeah. it's, it's, it's a mysterious place. What, what kind of people are the Marsh people, though? They're unique. Oh. They're, they're like nobody else in the world. Yeah. I mean, during the war, we took all the Marsh signposts down. And after the war, nobody had put them up. <laughs> it was to full the hun, you see. And I asked a Marshman, I said, when are you going to put up the, uh, the, the signposts? Yeah. He said, well, no, not never. So I said, why not? I said, you never know. Tell us a story about the, the enemy plane that came in. Oh, yeah, that was incredible. We had um, an armoured uh, uh, plate armour on a, a truck, a yeah. flat uh, gondola truck, yeah. and we had two guns on it. We had uh, uh, a Vickers K, I think, and a boy's anti-tank rifle, which you and I remember yes, from yeah. the broken shoulder. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> uh, a German plane came over. It was a dive bomber. And it flew over and saw the train and came round again. Yeah. And on the German charts, because I saw one after, after the end of hostilities, it, it did not say Kleiner Bahnhof or Miniatur Bahnhof, it just said Bahnhof. So this idiot looks at it and says, Ach so ein Bahnhof. And of course it's one third scale. So he kept coming lower and lower and lower until he went into the marsh. We got out of it, but that was it. So theoretically we shot down, we shot down a jerry plane in the wall. Lovely days, aren't they? I mean, oh, that marvellous well, the, the days that we had, uh, especially the beginning of the Goon Show. Well, see, this all... is really yeah. a sort of a Goon Show on wheels, isn't it? Oh, it is. <laughs> when you think the whole thing is kept alive by a devoted band of brothers, uh, ancestors, who adore it and adore yeah. steam. We're still in the age of steam. Of course. And the Goon Show was steam radio. Same thing on Milligan lately. Yes. He's driving the train. Is he? Moment. He's up front. Oh, after you. you. Yes. <laughs> Here's the driver. Spike! Hello! Just a minute, I'm just getting control. <laughs> oh, God. What is it? Oh, you mate. No wonder we came via Huddersfield. Yes. How do you like driving the train, then? I, I like driving the train. Because yeah. <laughs> you're used to it being born in India. Yes, I was long, day, long train journeys across the Deccan Plains, yes. Yeah? I just do this for fun sometimes. Yeah. Not many people know that. <laughs> and I'm one of them. <laughs> You live near here in Rye, don't you? Yes, I have to. My house is there. <laughs> so I, I like to live near it. Yes, yes, I do. No, I moved in the country because I like it, the peace and quiet of it, yes. And you could the, say that. Yeah. It's dull, flat and boring, the rump yeah. marsh, but there's no place like home. <laughs> yes, it was, in the 16th century, an absolute hive for smugglers. The most famous one was Peter Whitehead. That's right. Yeah. And uh, he used Adventure to... Adventure of the Torpedo. Yes. He, he used to deal in cognac and Malmsey, the stuff they killed the, the Duke of Clarence with. Drowned him and, in a butt and, off. Yeah. And there's a wonderful... One of the old place names is worth having. It's called Dumb Woman's Lane. Why is it called Dumb Woman's Lane? There's a well, theory there's a, that. there's a, a legend, a story, that it was a witch-burning area yeah. where they used to cut their tongues out so that they couldn't cast spells. Yeah. 
that's all run up, run up an overdraft at the bank. <laughs> Can't get all the we're off to Rye now, then. All right, then. Leave it to it. All the best, mate. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Nice <laughs> Don't then. lose it on the way. Right. All right. <laughs> Don't it's the right. other lever. Don't lose what on the way? <laughs> I won't be able to sleep, yeah. sleep tonight. <laughs> right, off we go again, then. You all right, hey? All right, mate. <laughs> This is the belfry of St. Augustine's Church, Brooklyn. It dates back to the 13th century, when these heavy oak beams stood in the open, supporting a two-ton bell which needed eight men to ring it. Like all the ancient churches in the Romney Marsh, this one is in need of constant repair. Julian Druitt is a member of the Historic Churches Trust. Julian, why is the belfry separate from the church? This was the edge of the sea here, and uh, it was probably built separately because the church uh, wouldn't be able to stand the weight of the belfry and the bells in oh, it. I see, yes. And uh, one of the funnier stories about it is that uh, it fell off the church uh, because it was so shocked to see an elderly spinster, an elderly bachelor, actually coming to the church to get married. <laughs> but I don't think that's uh, uh, the really true story. I think it's really the weight of the whole place and uh, it was built separately uh, to house a couple of bells. It's just been uh, repaired, isn't it, and yes, refurbished yes, and things? Yes, and I think that will stand restored now for really another hundred years. We won't have to do it again. <laughs> now, you founded the um, Brooklyn Singers. Tell us about those. The Singers really are interesting because they're of three or four different denominations of the Christian Church. That's good. And they can yeah. all come together for yes. an yeah. even song here, and yet they go to their own churches on a Sunday morning. Tell us what you're going to sing. We're going to sing an anthem uh, called Listen, Sweet Dove by Grace to Knives. It's an anthem about the season of Pentecost, uh, which season we're still in now. Yeah. And it speaks about the gifts of the Spirit. It speaks about, uh, to me anyway... Fairfield Church is the only Anglican church dedicated to the martyr Thomas a Becket in his own diocese of Canterbury. It's isolated in the middle of fields, once prone to regular flooding, has always seen more sheep than congregation. Karen Jesse Sage is chaplain to the agricultural and rural communities in Kent. Well, one of the extraordinary phenomena that we're facing today is the fact that we've got this shift of population, a demographic shift, as we mm. say, of people from the cities and people from the towns moving into the villages and settling. So our villages today consist of many different cultures, many different forms of spirituality, and this causes a lot of tension in our villages yeah. because people think one thing's right and people think another thing's right and so there's a lot of argument and, and so on. Yeah. Now the church has a responsibility there. We've somehow got to hold people together yeah. to help them sort of grow really, to understand what the countryside's all about, what the farming world's all about, and to understand what community life's all about in our villages. There are a lot of medieval churches on the marsh, aren't there? How relevant are they to the modern church? Like medieval churches over the country, all over the country, we used to think of these things as a real burden about our neck. But today, it's different. The medieval churches seem to be a gift because we have a, a, a visual aid in which countless thousands of tourists and visitors can actually come in, they can look around the church, and they can see there something about their Christian faith. It's easy to forget that...